Uh, hello. Um, my name is Andre Panakoa. I'm going to be talking about acquisition methods for morphometry. Thanks for um, coming or staying for this uh, optional talk. Um, so the main message of this talk is that um, small mistakes that you might make at the beginning in choosing your imaging protocol um, can result in a lot of manual intervention work later on. Um, so for example, if you use an anti-rage to uh, collect your anatomical um, scans and you choose the wrong TR at the beginning, you might end up um, having to do a whole lot of manual intervention. So this uh, little kitten of a problem, just choosing the right TR in the beginning could grow into a very big problem later on when you have to do a lot of manual intervention. So this talk is about how to choose your parameters so that you get good images and you can avoid work later. Um, I'm first going to uh, just mention a couple of artifacts um, that are relevant to um, free surfer. Uh, the first one is chemical shift artifact. Which is the little laser pointer. So um, this is a skull stripped uh, brain, of course, but um, the skull strip has left a little bit of fat here around the eyes. Um, and this fat has been shifted because of the chemical shift artifact. And it's shifted in the readout direction, which is head foot in this case. And the readout direction can be chosen with uh, one of two polarities, which result in the shift being up or down. So in this case, the shift was up, and the orbital fat shifted into the brain. So just by choosing your acquisition so that the rotation is 180 degrees on the Siemens scanner, or um, changing the polarity of the readout gradient, you could have this uh, orbital fat shift in the opposite direction away from the cortex. Uh, and a free surfer wouldn't get confused uh, when it tries to make this um, surface. This is probably an artifact familiar to all of you. This ringing comes from motion during the acquisition. Um, One question. Would yes. you use that brain in any kind of analysis? Like, is it too much motion? Like this? Uh, that's a good question. I think people uh, may have subject populations that just all look like this, and then they run it. And Freesurfer does a decent job. On a brain like this, it would complete. Um, but your accuracy would be compromised. So um, after this, Dylan will be talking about methods that we have for correcting motion during acquisitions. And um, he will also talk about how big the differences are when you don't do that. So uh, if, you, if you stay for that uh, talk, then uh, you might answer that question. You can see cortical thickness differences because of motion. And it's kind of scary um, that uh, your subject population that moves, your patients may move systematically more than your uh, control group, and you will see uh, biases in the thickness uh, because of that. But Dylan will talk about that uh, in the next talk. Um, so Doug may have, I think, talked about boundary-based registration. So he uses a surface, and this method works really well for um, registering uh, EPI scans to um, anatomicals using this uh, boundary. Um, but uh, in EPI, of course, um, susceptibility artifacts are uh, very severe, like here in the front. Um, and so uh, you, know, you just have to keep this in mind uh, with EPI. Uh, that susceptibility artifacts can uh, affect you, and I'm going to talk about those a little more, uh, even in anatomical scans. So people with EPI are pretty familiar with these kinds of artifacts, but they actually affect you in anatomical scans as well. Um, even though they settle their important homophonic because you want to be accurate. Um, so uh, this person was uh, put in the scanner, everything seemed to be fine, and then this big chunk of brain was missing, uh, and that was because um, this person had a hair clip, or a hair um, band. So it seemed to be innocuous, it wasn't magnetic, a magnet wouldn't pick up that uh, band, but had it then thread of um, metal. Uh, which conducts electricity, so as the gradients are switching, um, currents are chased around in that little loop, and it forms a small local magnet, and that messes up the, um, the field in that region, and of course, this big artifact. Uh, the point of this slide is just to um, remind you that a 3D encoded sequence has two phase encode directions, and it's wrapped in both of those directions. So the readout is head foot, and for free, you get rid of the wrap. There's not going to be a wrap of the neck up there because this is the readout direction and it's twice over sample. Um, but in this phase encoding direction, and in this phase encoding direction, there's uh, potentially a wrap. So you have to make sure your field of view is big enough so you don't get 
uh, what it gets to be another person that everyone has done. Um, and then I'm going to talk about this a little more later on, but here's just an example of a bit of dura uh, next to the cortex that FreeSurfer has included in its structures. So the cortical thickness estimate there will be too big because dura has been considered by FreeSurfer to be part of the uh, cortex. Uh, and then just in general, uh, we try to optimize our scans so that the uh, contrast between gray and white matter is good. Um, this scan has pretty poor contrast. Uh, it's pretty flat. Um, and FreeSurfer wasn't able to find the sulcus, for example, because of the poor contrast. So I'm going to, in the next section, talk about a protocol that we recommend for FreeSurfer um, acquisitions. Um, I'll first talk about contrast in general in MRI, and then how we uh, optimize contrast in the anti-rage for a good um, scan to work with FreeSurfer. We talk a little bit about distortions, and then about positioning and motion correction. So, uh, the aim here is to figure out what's the best um, sequence to use or protocol to use for brain morphometry, in particular for FreeSurfer. Uh, before I answer that question, I just want to talk about uh, contrast in MRI in general. So the first contrast is proton density weighting, PD weighting. Um, every sequence has PD weighting. Uh, uh, this stands to reason because the amount of signal that you get from any voxel uh, is, um, depends on how many spins there are in that voxel. Um, so no matter what other contrast you have, you always have proton density weighting. And an example of a sequence that only results in proton density weighting is this flash or a spot gradient echo sequence if you have a low flip angle and a short TR. So for TR 20 milliseconds, 5 degree flip angle, you get a proton density weighted um, image like this. If you increase the flip angle, then you get more and more T1 weighting as you increase the flip angle, and that gives nice gray white contrast. Uh, if you want T2 uh, in a 3D scan, then you can use something like T2 space. <coughs> Teacher space actually has a T2 over T1 um, uh, weighting. And of course, both of these scans also have PD weighting. Um, T2 contrast is popular clinically because tumors are bright in T2, um, but CSF is also bright, so um, that's why fluid attenuated inversion recovery or flare um, T2 sequences are popular clinically because the CSF is um, suppressed while the tumor is still bright. Uh, T2 star is a um, very versatile uh, contrast. Uh, that's why I've dedicated this whole slide to it. Um, it can be used, or it's implicated in bone imaging, dark blood imaging, uh, in the bulb effect, and uh, susceptibility weighted imaging. So, bone, for example, has a very short TE, um, less than 7 microseconds. Uh, this means that if you want to capture the signal from bone, you need to excite the tissue and then uh, read out very quickly after the excitation. Um, so you need to have a very short TE, in other words. So with radial acquisitions, you can achieve this very short uh, TE, the sequence is called ultra short TE sequence. Uh, with a, a TE of 70 microseconds, it's possible to get bone. <clears throat> At more reasonable TE values, 2 to 10 milliseconds, with flash, you can get conventional anatomicals. And then in bold, we deliberately make the TE a little longer to emphasize the bold effect. What you're measuring in bold is, um, is T2 star. And this changes when the hemoglobin molecule is oxygenated or not. So this movie shows the hemoglobin molecule changing shape when it becomes oxygenated or deoxygenated. There's a little iron atom in there, and that iron atom the exposure of the iron atom to the local environment changes when there's oxygen there, um, and this changes the local T2 star. And so what we measure is the T2 star um, in the two states and find the difference. And the optimal TE to detect that difference is 20 milliseconds at high field and 40 milliseconds at um, low field. So for example, at 70, you might choose 20 milliseconds for the TE, uh, for 1.5 T scans to use 40 milliseconds, uh, sort of on average for the brain. And then if you increase the um, TE even more, then you can really emphasize uh, blood uh, in the images. And this is what the susceptibility weighted imaging does. 
So this is an ICS.gi scanner. It's also popular clinically. Um, these vessels that come out here are really exaggerated. But the, what you're getting here is this is an artifact around the vessel. So just like the uh, hairband, uh, where the hairband was a lot smaller than the artifact that we saw. The same is true here. These vessels are smaller than what you actually see here. Um, but the point of making the TE longer is to exaggerate the artifact. Uh, and uh, make these microbleeds and other things that you're looking for uh, much more prominent. Also, SWI averages across local, um, across a bunch of slices, um, so that these vessels are typically continuous, otherwise you just see a little bit of it in each slice. <coughs> so back to the question of what uh, sequence to use for um, for morphometry and for free circular specifically. Uh, from the previous discussion, we want a T1 uh, weighted image, of course, because the gray white matter contrast is good. And this is an example of such an image. But we can actually do better than that. By inserting an inversion pulse uh, every so often in the flash scan, we get what's called an empty rage scan, and it emphasizes or it exaggerates gray white contrast at the expense of a little SNR. Um, so there's two reasons why the protocol that we recommend is good for pre -surfer. The first one is that we've worked out these um, parameters, timing parameters for the anchor rate, so that gray, white, and CSF are optimally far apart in brightness. Um, but the other reason is that pre has been trained to use this data. So you may disagree that this is the best scan to use, uh, but because pre has an atlas that's based on these kind of scans, it probably work best with this kind of um, sequence, even if you can do a better job in gray, white, contrast. Uh, so yes, the recommended protocol, start with the localizer, a scout automatically positions the, um, the, the next scans so that they're all in the same position. Then if all you want to do is a cortical thickness study or you want to make a surface to show your fMRI results on, uh, really all you need is to run one empty ridge. It would take six minutes for one millimeter isotropic. Um, but if you have extra time, or if you want to do a better job on subcortical segmentation, we actually recommend doing two flash scans with two different flip angles, and I'll get to why in the next couple of slides. Um, then you could also do for T2 contrast and T2 space. And the protocol that's on this website um, describes the parameters for all these sequences, um, and they're all bandwidth matched. And the purpose of bandwidth matching them is to make sure that the distortions are the same for all the scans. Um, so to explain why that's the case, in this slide I'm showing uh, an empty ridge with a low bandwidth. This is actually a standard bandwidth, uh, single echo empty ridge. The bandwidth is 195 hertz per pixel. And um, the important thing is that the distortion in uh, this empty um, ridge is uh, proportional to the error in the field, but it's also inversely proportional to the bandwidth. So, uh, and it follows the readout direction. So if you look at this point, <coughs> where the little red mark is. You can see there's a reasonably thick piece of cortex there. But if I switch the readout direction, that goes away. And this is the same person, same um, day in the scanner. Uh, all that happened is that polarity of the readout gradient changed. And Siemens has actually changed this from one software version to another, because from a clinical point of view, people don't care about this. But for your morphometry study, of course, that's critical. And the correct value for cortical thickness would be somewhere in between the values from these two scans. Um, so what can we do about this? Uh, we can use a higher bandwidth. This will reduce the distortion, but it also lowers SNR because we're keeping the ADC open for short and we don't get much signal. So, but in the time that we had one long readout, we could do a whole lot of short readouts of high bandwidth and get that back to the signal. So what we do instead of one uh, uh, long, uh, low bandwidth readout. We do multiple echoes with high bandwidth. Uh, each of them has low SNR, and then we combine them all and we get back the SNR. So we have uh, good SNR and low distortion. This is the trick in multi-echo and rate, multi-echo flash. T2 space happens to have a high bandwidth anyway, so it is as good as we can get it to begin with. Um, using this trick, we can uh, make sure that the structures align quite nicely across the contrasts. Uh, so you have an example of a 30 degree flash with T1 uh, weighting. Uh, you have a TD weighted 5 degree flash, uh, T2 space, and empty rate. Um, so if I flip between them, 
see the old nice scale line and undiscovered rows to one another because of the high bandwidth. Uh, this slide shows what regions of the surface are affected by um, these distortions. It's the areas that you know very well around the air canals, um, uh, temporal pole, uh, inferior frontal areas, so all susceptibility areas, and these um, displacements that occur with the low bandwidth can be much diminished if you use high bandwidth and multiple echoes. Multiple echoes. Um, so why do we recommend running flash at different foot angles? Uh, well, the reason is that we can estimate T1 and PV uh, from the scans. That means we can, instead of getting a T1 weighted image, we can get a, um, a quantitative value for T1 at each voxel. We want to know what is the T1 in milliseconds in a voxel. We don't want just some kind of combination of um, uh, parameters in the image. So for each voxel, the signal in the flash scan is described by this equation. You can see that there's two groups of parameters in this equation. There's parameters that depend on the sequence, the repetition time, the echo time, um, the flip angle, alpha, and there's parameters that depend on the tissue, the proton density of P here, um, the T to start on P1. And the thing is, we don't care about the scan or the sequence parameters. We don't want that stuff in the image. We want to have an image that just tells us something about the tissue. So ideally, we want to solve this equation for T1, T2 star, and PD, and, and just use that parameter in our studies. Um, so by choosing a short TE, we can get rid of this term, and then we've got an equation with two unknowns. We can just two, choose two different flip angles. We can have two equations and two, two unknowns, and we can solve for T1 and uh, PD. Uh, we can estimate T2 star also from the multiple echoes if we want to. Once we have those T1 and PD volumes, we can synthesize a volume with any flip angle, and I'll show you that in a later slide. So you have the pre surfing commands um, to do the fitting. MRA MS clip arms uh, is the command. You just run this with a different volume speed, the different volumes with the different flip angles, and give it an output directory, and it'll put in that directory your T1 estimates and uh, uh, PD estimates and T2 star for you. You can use the MRI synthesize command to make a volume from those T1s and PDs. You can say, what would my image have looked like if I did a 50 degree flip angle, even though you didn't collect it. So you have an example of the PD volume estimated that way. There's the T1 from the previous day. And yes, the T2 star. T2 star admittedly looks noisy, and that's because we use a single exponential. In fact, T2 star is much more complicated. Uh, multiple <coughs> exponentials. Um, are involved and so this estimate isn't very good, but for an average on an ROI it would be okay to use that. So um, why would you want to synthesize uh, flash scans with uh, arbitrary flip angles? Um, this slide shows an example where this was useful for us. This is data from neonates in Cape Town. These are um, we're studying uh, fetal alcohol exposed um, <coughs> kids there. And um, this is a two-day-old neonate. Uh, we managed in this neonate to collect two scans with two different flip angles, and the uh, neonate didn't move um, during the scans. So those were two six-minute scans. Uh, so the baby had to stay asleep for 12 minutes. If the baby wakes up, then all bets are off. We don't get any good images. So now the problem might be, well, we don't have 12 minutes with every neonate. Um, if we only had six minutes, which flip angle should we use to get an image <coughs> nice gray white contrast? So what we did was we synthesized what the image would have looked like on this um, neonate, all different flip angles. So this image right now is the two degree um, flip angle. And if I show the movie, then you can see there what the flip angle is. You can see how the contrast changes. So if you ask the physicist, which uh, flip angle should I use then? The physicist may say, well, you should use the Ernst angle because that's the angle at which the um, SNR is highest. And this is the Ernst angle for, these, for this particular scan. And T1 value. You can see the image is very nice and bright at that Ernst angle. Uh, but it's quite flat. If you go to higher flip angles, you get better gray white contrast. So the Ernst angle isn't necessarily the best uh, angle to use, and you need to, depending on what, what um, structures you want to 
to distinguish from one another, you may want to choose a different flip angle, and that's a kind of vertical question. <coughs> uh, another interesting thing is that if you want to optimize or we want to maximize gray wave contrast um, in the cortex, it depends which part of cortex you're interested in. This cortex doesn't have the same T1 value everywhere. So, for example, if you're interested in that area, then 25 degrees of angle would best separate gray white there. Uh, whereas over here, you want to choose a much lower flip angle. Um, so, another interesting thing with multi grain of rage is that you can separate dura from cortex. So, here is a bit of dura. It's not obvious that it's dura because it has the same brightness as the adjacent cortex. <coughs> It's a little more obvious here because of the geometry. There's a piece of dura. Free surface in this yellow surface has included the dura and the vortex and got the vortical thickness from here. If we go to the fourth echo of the empty rage, this echo is much more T2 star weighted. Dura has a shorter T2 star than cortex, so dura has almost disappeared here, whereas cortex also got darker, but it didn't disappear completely. Um, so we can use the combination of the first and the fourth echoes to distinguish Dura from Cortex. If you run a normal single echo and the rage, uh, this is what it's going to look like. It's going to have this flat contrast. So the multi-echo is useful for uh, distinguishing Dura from Cortex, and um, there's a command in Presurfer uh, to uh, correct that. That I'll get to in a couple of slides. Um, if you have that today, I'll ask this. Uh, he has a 3D um, version of uh, the surface. Uh, this is with the Dura included in the surfaces. And after the correction, you can see that it changed a bit in the regions you'd expect. But also, um, in the parietal area, you can watch there's some subtle changes there where Dura has been included. There's some kind of weird bump up there, which kind of goes away. And I think there's still a little bit of Dura there, so it's not perfect. But it definitely cleans it up quite a bit. <coughs> These are the commands for directing the Dura. It's a, it's a post-processing step, so you run pre-surfer, recon all, and then run this afterwards um, to correct for the Dura. Um, uh, to make this, yeah, it may be that this is built in, um, but I think it has to be run separately. Um, um, and I just want to quickly point out that um, the gradient system of the modern scanners is quite nonlinear. <clears throat> so here we scanned a phantom, which is a cylinder with beads in it, <coughs> water, and um, these beads are in a, in a matrix that's perfectly rectangular. But you can see this forward effect. That's not real. That's because of the gradient distortion. Uh, GE seems both have this uh, problem. This can be corrected, and Presurfer has a command for doing this. And I convert and uh, correct the distortions for you. For example, for our neonates, um, we're interested in the cerebellum because it's affected by alcohol. Uh, we may want to uh, figure out whether the cerebellum has changed in size. If we don't do this correction, cerebellum is up here, uh, potentially. We may get much smaller measurements than what reality is if we don't do this correction. So I just wanted to uh, point out that there's a technology on the Siemens scanner called AutoLine. Uh, what it does is it um, you put a person in the scanner, it measures the position of the person's head, compares it with a, um, an atlas, and um, uh, which is in a stereotype position, and then every scan from that point on is aligned to that atlas. So that way, if you scan the same person more than once, they'll be um, scanned in the same position. And in a cross-sectional study, all your subjects will be more or less um, scanned in the same position. Um, uh, so Dylan is going to talk after this about motion correction um, and uh, volume navigators. Uh, this is not a kind of navigator called a flow leaf navigator, but it's the same idea. What we do here is we run an anatomical scan and we intersperse these uh, navigators inside the um, uh, sequence. And every time we run this little navigator, we can make an estimate of the position of the head and correct the gradient so that we follow the person around as we're scanning. Um, this uh, navigator takes five milliseconds to play out. 
and they could make a rough estimate of their position um, to correct the next TR in 20 millisecond uh, flash scan. <coughs> Here's an example of that flash scan uh, with no motion correction, the error is corrected, and this is an average of corrected scans. This is what the motion was during the scan. Translations and rotations. Um, yeah, I think I've run out of time, so I'll just quickly uh, point out something about the scan. This is a CT scan. It has 200 micron isotropic um, resolution. Uh, it took 20 seconds to collect, and this is just a skull. This, this is not a living person. Uh, we put the skull in the MRI scan. It took 25 minutes to collect this image with the resolution of 1 to 2 millimeters. Interesting that the coil elements also come up in the scan. This is using ultra short TV scan. The point is when you do a long scan, 20, 20 minute scan, and you're trying to find something subtle with a, a very small signal like bone, you have to do motion correction as well. Um, the sequence can be split up into sections so you have small windows that you can reconstruct separately and see where the person is located all throughout the scan and register them together. Make a corrected image. That's what we've done. Um, so this is. Uh, just a quick preview of what Dylan's going to be talking about. Uh, in the MPRH, our favorite um, sequence for morphometry, uh, he has inserted volume navigators, and uh, they enable real time correction of motion. This is a scan without motion correction, that's with motion correction. Um, all right, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, are there any questions? Correction for the direct, you can do just with the multi accuracy rate, or you need to to add the additional thing with the flash scans. Or the oh no, you don't have to. You can do. In fact, um, we we don't use the flash scan for that. So just the multi accuracy rate. So that those additional flash scans would be useful. If you want a better resolution support your structure. Um, there's two things. Uh, if you want. To do subcortical segmentation, you can combine the so your SMT1P and then synthesize a 22 degree flash scan, and that's actually better for uh, segmentation than the MP reach. Also, theoretically, you've got more information, so you could do a better segmentation um, job if you use all that information, but a piece of it doesn't actually use it. Um, but mainly, you want to do the multiple tips if you uh, want to estimate T1 and PD quantitatively. So, if you write your paper and you say, you know, amygdala in your patient group look different from your control group. If you just had an empty rate, you'd be saying, well, the contrast was, or well, the intensity was different, but it's a combination of things going into that. Uh, but if you estimate T1, then you can say, well, it was on average 1,100 milliseconds in the patients and 1,000 milliseconds in the, um, in the controls. And somebody else could replicate that on a different kind of a scan with a different sequence, and the numbers would still be the same. And so that's the power of, um, Doing the modification. <laughs>